The moon is our nearest celestial neighbor, and yet only three nations have ever landed on the moon, and they've all been superpowers. What if the moon were accessible to the world? What would that look like? Let's start by looking back. The three nations that landed, the former Soviet Union, 1970-1973, they sent a rover the size of a small car to the surface of the moon called Lunokhod. It was actually the first robotic rover to ever land on the moon and drive around. And then everybody knows the Apollo story. Apollo landed on the surface of the moon, um, delivered people, drove across the surface with, with astronauts at the wheel. Uh, and then just recently, the last few years, China landed on the moon. They did the world's first far side landing on the moon. And that's important because they had to use a relay satellite. It's the side of the moon that we don't see here on Earth. So you have to ask yourself the question, zooming one step back out again, is why space? Um, at 1.60 years ago when space flight was just beginning, space was not accessible. And since then, remarkable things have happened. Space is now a $360 billion industry worldwide, and only a quarter of that is government spending. The four main pillars of the space market are communications, first and foremost. Think satellite phones, satellite TV, satellite radio. The second, we all have in our pockets, a GPS. GPS powers everything from autonomous cars to ships sailing the seas um, down to surveying. Um, it's, it's an incredibly valuable asset for everyone. Uh, the next is Earth observation. All those weather satellites that we see, uh, the images back, we see hurricanes out in the oceans and see them coming in, that all comes from satellites. Uh, and there's a whole array of them up there giving us data in real time. The next is defense. Um, every uh, theater of war needs real-time uh, data, and one of the best ways to do that is through a satellite network. It's hard to get up there and hard, uh, hard to take it down. So in the 60 years of space, 6,600 spacecraft have gone into Earth orbits. And we've actually lived and worked in space of the 60 years that we've been in space for 40 years. So living in space is actually kind of old hat at this point. But if you take one step out from Earth to the moon, there's only been 65 spacecraft to ever orbit the moon, land on the moon, or drive across the surface. And we've only spent two weeks, two weeks, living and operating on the surface of the moon. The sum of all of the Apollo missions was two weeks. The astronauts landed in the morning, and they left before it got too hot in the afternoon. If you take one step further beyond the moon, we've never sent people out there and only 135 spacecraft have, just, have gone out to find out things about every other place in the solar system. So we're just beginning to scratch the surface of activities beyond Earth. So why the moon? Why should we go there? What's the whole big thing about it? Why is it you know, showing up in the news and it is the next big thing? The first is that the moon could become a fuel depot. There are vast quantities of water at the poles of the moon, and if you have water, you can split it into ox oxygen and hydrogen, condense it, you just made rocket fuel. That's the same fuel that powered the shuttle. So the moon could become a gas station, a refueling station uh, for spacecraft that want to go back and forth from the moon and also explore deep space uh, and even potentially get to Mars. There's studies that show you could get to Mars dramatically cheaper by using fuel from the moon. The next is mining. There are, interestingly enough, lots of rare earth metal mine sites here on Earth that are located near impact sites. So those are impactors coming in, hitting Earth, leaving those raw deposits. And on the moon, they've been collecting on the surface for millions of years. And there's no plate tectonics or anything that's turning over the, the soil on the moon. So all that material is right on the surface, uh, ripe for us to go and get. And an interesting question that will face us at some point is would you rather mine the, a lifeless, airless body like the moon or mine our delicate blue planet here on Earth? Manufacturing on the moon could be a total game changer. The environment of the moon is very different than what we're used to here on Earth. It's one-sixth of gravity uh, from here on Earth. It's also a natural vacuum environment. So could there be materials that could be manufactured there and only there because of that specific environment? One of the most exciting near-term things that we're going to see on the moon is all of the exploration and science that's going to come back. One of the greatest discoveries on the moon that I don't think gets enough attention are actually entrances to caves under the surface of the moon. 
They looked just like craters, which is why we didn't know about them for quite some time. And we took satellites and looked at them from different angles and noticed that, oh, wow, that's an entrance. And if you can get inside these caves, some of them are big. There's one that they think could be the size of Philadelphia. And why is that significant? I mean, your cave on the moon, that's cool, right? But what, what could that do? It is shelter. Just like humans settled in caves on Earth first, we could settle in caves on the moon first. It's natural protection from the elements. The elements on the moon, you've got radiation that comes from the sun. It doesn't have a magnetic sphere like Earth does to deflect a lot of that radiation. If you're underground, you're protected. It has micrometeorites. So what we see as beautiful displays in the night sky is streaking uh, of light here and there. When you're on the moon, that's a different story. All those rocks are coming down. If you're underneath meters of, of uh, rock, you're going to be pretty well protected. And the next on the moon, one of the most challenging parts is the thermal extremes. The lit part of the moon, the part that you see in the night sky at night, is 120 degrees Celsius or about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're standing on the, at the equator of the moon, it stays that temperature for almost two weeks. And then nighttime comes, and it gets even worse. It gets down to liquid nitrogen cold for 14 days. And that's an incredibly challenging environment. If you're in a cave, you're protected. So the caves could be one of the first places that humans live off Earth. And these caves are not only on the moon, they're also on Mars. If we can learn to live on the land on the moon, we could then go to Mars. And ultimately, that's how we're going to become a multi-planet species. So that brings us to the here and now, and the lander sitting right behind me here up on stage. This is Peregrine. This is the lander that will be delivering payloads from all over the world up to the surface of the moon. So this lander is being built here in Pittsburgh. I literally walked a couple blocks to, to the, uh, to the uh, theater tonight um, for, for, for the presentation. This lander here is our delivery truck. We take payloads and attach them above and below the decks. We can take rovers and science instruments and all kinds of devices. The big things that you see on the lander are the fuel tanks. Two fuel, two oxidizer, they're liquids. You mix them together, they go boom. You aim that explosion out of a rocket nozzle, you got rocket propulsion. Um, so this vehicle is the vehicle that flies on top of a launch vehicle, goes out to the moon, and delivers the payloads to the surface of the moon. So what is it like if the moon is accessible to the world? What, who's going to go there? What are we going to see? How is it going to look? Um, we are writing that story now. And the first mission is our Peregrine mission. We have 28 payloads flying on our first mission. We recently signed a $79 million contract with NASA to carry 14 of their payloads to the surface of the moon. Among those payloads is a payload that will be a precursor to detecting and determining the kinds of water and resources at the poles of the moon. Um, uh, so an incredible next step towards take, be, making the moon a, a refueling station. We also have a payload from Mexico, the Mexican Space Agency, a fairly new space agency in the world, but they could be the fourth nation to operate on the moon after China because they're flying with us. And what an amazing, momentous occasion for their country, and it's a proud moment for us to be a part of that story. We also have a company who wants to create the first infrastructure on the moon. It's a company that wants to create a laser communication node from the surface of the moon, and that's going to increase the bandwidth capability dramatically, orders of magnitude. It's like upgrading from an old 56K modem to fiber optic connection. That's going to give us HD streaming videos and immersive potential uh, virtual reality experiences from the surface of the moon. This is not Apollo from 50 years ago. This is a whole new world. We also are reaching the opposite side of the world, the country of Nepal, where they are actually sending a rock from Everest to the surface of the moon. And that's closing a circle because there was a, an, an astronaut who brought a rock from the moon and climbed the peak of Everest. And we haven't, thought of, we haven't forgotten about Pittsburgh. Um, Pittsburgh is going to the moon. The Heinz History Center just recently had their, their moon exhibit, and as part of that, we, we held a voting contest to see what of Pittsburgh will be sent to the moon. There was terrible towel. <laughs> there were songs from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. 
There was a write-in for the cookie from Eaton Park. <laughs> that actually did quite well. The one that won is the Kennywood token. So the Kennywood token is going to represent Pittsburgh on our mission to the moon. <laughs> so here's what the mission looks like. We start with a launch from Florida. It's a 200-foot tall launch vehicle. Our spacecraft is bolted to the top of it. And at this point, the launch vehicle takes off. This is like seeing a skyscraper in Pittsburgh skyline just going up and keep on going up. This, this, uh, the air around you is shaking, the, vi the building you're standing on is vibrating, and this thing is just going. Uh, this is a two-stage vehicle that's going up to space. Our spacecraft is sitting up on top of it. Uh, the solid rocket motors on the side are just breaking away here. When the atmosphere is thin enough, the fairing breaks away. That's what you just saw there. Um, and then our, we're actually hitching a ride to space, so the primary vehicle, the vehicle on top paying most of the bill to get to space is, is right up on top. Second stage fires pushes us up farther and farther towards space. And at this point, we're, we're letting off the first rider uh, up to space. We're gonna take that second stage, we're gonna spin it back around, and we're gonna shoot off the adapter ring. And then at this point, this is the first time you'll see Peregrine attached to the second stage of the launch vehicle. And this is life-size, full-scale, right here standing next to me that's gonna be flying to space. So the second stage fires towards the moon, and at this point, we either are going to hit the moon or fly past it. This is where our job starts. We need to make sure that we're lined up just right with lunar orbit. We need to get out to the moon, and once we're close, we need to fire our engines just right to drop into lunar orbit. And then we need to start our descent on the far side of the moon for a nice soft landing down on the surface of the moon. Our first landing on the surface of the moon is gonna be in July of 2021. And this is what it might look like. And I love this video because this is Pittsburgh, but you can't tell. This is, this is a slag heap in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so for those that don't know, that's the tailings from the steel industry. So we go out at night with a big bright light and it looks just like the moon. <laughs> so if you wanna fake a moon landing, I got a spot. <laughs> <laughs> this is very, very real. We are going to the moon, and I am so proud to say that Pittsburgh is leading the world back to the moon. Thank you. <laughs>